Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Sam, welcome onto the Australian Finance Podcast today. Hi, Kate. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Now, you have a lot of experience in the finance industry and you were just telling us off air before you've been working at Melbourne Business School for well over a decade, which as a young person is hard to imagine staying in one spot that long. But just to, to kick off this episode, it'd be great to um, if you could tell us a little bit about how you got into the industry and what you do maybe day to day in your job as an educator. Well, I, I sort of became an economist, not exactly by accident, but I started off as an engineer, went to work for the federal government for a bit, um, thought about studying an MBA, and then was drawn into economics, um, went over to, overseas with my wife, Tracy, went to London, and she worked for the city of Westminster, and, and I did a PhD at the University of London, and then we went to America for seven years, uh, and I was a professor at Dartmouth University, and then, and then we came back to, to Australia and I've been at the University of Melbourne uh, since then. And so I teach in the business school uh, in, at the University of Melbourne, not in the economics department, not in the undergraduate economics department, but in the graduate business school. You know, universities have got graduate schools for medicine and law and architecture and veterinary science and, and business. Yeah, and so that's where I teach. Uh, and I work on things to do with banks, to do with corporations, um, to do with wealth management, um, etc. So we've got you on the podcast today to break down some of the concepts about the economy that really listeners should know, but maybe don't know. And even some of the things that I really want to learn a bit more about, because sometimes we t toss around terms on the podcast, like inflation and interest rates and the Reserve Bank. We we don't unpack them. So on today's podcast, um, we've got you on to really explore all of those things in more details. And to kick it off, I was wondering if you could explain what is economics and why as investors and just individuals living in, in the country that we should be aware of this? Well, economics is science. It's a social science. It's not a physical science um, like, like physics or chemistry or biological science. Uh, or a life science. It's not one of those sciences. It's a social science, like psychology or sociology or the like. It deals with humans. And in particular, it deals with how people make decisions about resources. I know that sounds like a whole bunch of jargon, but, but it is about that, about how people make choices. And so the kind of choices that you and I need to make, so how much am I going to work uh, to earn as opposed to how much of my time am I going to spend on something else? When I make money, how much of it, uh, the government's going to take a big chunk of that in taxes. But then apart from that, how much am I going to save as opposed to how much I'm going to spend? And when I spend it, what am I going to spend it on? So am I going to spend it on travel, accommodation, health, um, um, food, uh, entertainment, etc. And when I save it, where am I going to put it? Am I going to put it in the bank? Am I going to put it in my super? Am I going to save for a deposit for a house, um, etc.? See, those are all choices. That's the first thing, understanding how people make choices. But then the second thing is, all of those choices add up to something. So individuals make choices, individual people like you and me, Kate, but also individual companies like BHP or, or CSL or National Australia Bank. They're really big companies, but small companies are the same. You know, like a local plumbing company or local travel agent. They have to make choices about what they're going to produce, how much they're going to charge in price, how many people they're going to hire, how much they're going to, to, to pay those people. Etc. So you've got individuals, companies making choices, and all of those choices add up to something. They all come together. You know, the, the total number of people deciding whether they're going to get rid of their petrol car and get and buy an electric car adds up to the total demand, the total increase in demand for electric cars and decrease in demand for petrol cars. And then from that, you get from the total demand and total supply by companies bringing things to market you get prices 
in the, the aggregation, the bringing together of all those individual choices. And that's the second thing that economics is about. Firstly, it's about those individual choices. Then it's about what all those choices add up to. And they add up to lots of things. They add up to interest rates. They add up to how much the Aussie dollar is worth versus the US dollar. They add up to inflation. They add up to total government spending. All of those macro things, they're interesting. You know, the micro of individual decisions adds up to the macro of, of exchange rates and interest rates and, and prices and government spending, et cetera. And then the third thing, and it's a long answer, so I'll be briefer. But the third thing is we're interested in the organizations that bring all that together, the government, the banks, the super funds, the companies, the unions, all of those kind of organizations that facilitate that choice making and all that, that economic activity. We're interested in those organizations, you know, how do they work? How should they work? You know, those kind of things. I think it's interesting to think of it that way as in all those individual choices, because sometimes um, a country's economy can seem like just something the government controls. Um, whereas that's a, yeah. a really different perspective, isn't it? Well, that's a, that's a, a neat insight um, that there's, that there is this sort of key difference between um, free market economies where individuals make those choices and those choices add up to macro things and centrally planned economies where some central planner, the government makes the choice and then basically tells people um, what they're going to do. Now, every real economy is somewhere in between those two things. You know, if, we, if, you, if you went back to sort of the, the Soviet Union, which, which for me, People talked about a lot when I was a young guy, but for you probably seems like about three or four centuries ago. But yeah. but actually, if you went back to the to the Soviet Union from the from the the last century, then there really was centrally planned. You know, they really did make up all these plans for how much wheat's going to be grown and how much steel there's going to be and what the price of this is going to be and the price of that. And they told everyone. So that was one extreme. And then also, if you went back a long way in history, there was no regulation. There was no sort of there was no regulation of what choices people were allowed to make or not. I mean, you, there was no minimum wage. You know, there was no regulation on how much pollution you could produce. Um, so, you need to have the right balance between people having the freedom to make their own choices and having some government control to make sure that those choices don't harm each other too much. And every country and every economy needs to to find that balance between the central planning and the, and the freedom of, of, of individual choices. And, and every country is at a different point on those spectrums. Australia is quite a long way towards sort of free markets and individuals getting to, to make their own choices and do, and do, do what they want. And that's interesting. Just bringing it back to finance, like something like getting a statement of advice from a financial advisor, like we've spoken about in the show, is quite expensive. And maybe the financial advisor wants to charge only $100, but they can't because there is some manner of regulation and oversight and compliance involved by the government. So I guess that would be when you talked about the, the free market and the sort of centrally planned, that might be somewhere in the middle there where not each party doesn't get full control. So it sort of settles in the middle a bit. Yeah, well, that's a neat insight as well. Um, that, that that balance between government control and, and individual freedom and everyone, every country needs to find that balance. That in, in Australia, the, that has an expression in financial advice, as you were just saying. And Australia is kind of unique in that respect. So you can make a set of choices in Australia that you can't make elsewhere. So take, take super, for instance. So we have compulsory superannuation. So that's the government telling us what to do. 10% of our salaries have to go into, into superannuation at a maximum of 27.5K. Uh, but 10% of your salary goes into, into super, and you don't have any choice about that. But then once it does go into super, you have a lot of choice. I mean, you can move from, from super fund to super fund. That's true in most countries. But in Australia, you can have your own self-managed super fund. I know you know that, Kate. I know it's something, something you know a lot about. But, but the, in Australia, you can have your own super fund, not that, that you have, not where you can just say, oh, I want uh, I want a lot in Aussie shares and I don't want so much in bonds and I want a lot in commercial real estate and I don't want so much in, in, in global shares, for instance. Not, that, not just that kind of choice, but you can actually run the super fund completely yourself. You can be the trustee uh, of the super fund. That's a lot of choice. And so we have a lot of freedom in Australia. Unfortunately, 
freedom is can be a curse rather than a blessing unless you know what you're doing. And so, you know, ideally in Australia, what we would have is either very strong education, finance education and finance literacy. And that's what you're engaged in, right? Is elevating finance literacy um, for people, and especially for young people, which is an extremely helpful thing. So we'd either have good finance literacy or we'd have reliable, cheap, um, trustworthy financial advice. And, and then that freedom of choice, instead of being a curse, would be a blessing. Uh, but actually, we don't have either of those things. We don't have high levels of financial literacy. I know you're working on that and doing a good job. Um, I am too. Uh, so the, the, we don't have high levels of financial literacy and, and our financial advice sector is an absolute mess. And, and you, you said just a moment ago, Kate, that, that the high regulation of financial advice, which has come about through necessity because financial, because a lot's gone wrong in financial advice in Australia, has come about through necessity, but it does mean that it's more expensive than it, than it would be otherwise. And so it is quite problematic. Yeah, yeah. And one of the other terms that listeners may be aware of and have seen these people on the TV speaking about various issues is economists. And we've never had an economist on the show. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what they do, what their role is, and whether they're worth paying attention to when they start pulling out all the graphs and talking about the Australian dollar on the news each night. Well, so, so there's not a lot of people who call themselves economists, but, but economics is everywhere. It's, it's a little bit like um, you probably don't know a lot of people who would call themselves mathematicians. Um, you know, the, the viewers here on the podcast probably don't know anyone who would describe themselves as a mathematician, but you use maths all the time, um, all, all day, every day. You're making simple mental calculations. So you use maths, but you don't know anybody who studies or teaches maths. Of course, you know maths teachers, and we can think of them as, uh, as, as mathematicians. It's the same with economics. So you probably don't know anyone who's called an economist who studies economics and wants to understand it at a deeper level or teaches economics in school or at, or, or at university or works in a government department on economic policy. So you probably don't know anyone like that, but people use economics, use the, the fundamental ideas about, about the things we were talking about earlier, making choices and what those choices add up to and the different uh, institutions and intermediaries and organizations it gets used all the time uh, and everywhere. And so when that, when they pop up on TV, are they like, when they're giving you those charts and things, is they, is it more just sort of displaying the facts and them interpreting it in a certain way or um, do they sort of put their own spin on things or? Well, that's a, that's, that's a great question. That was the second half of your question. Um, so let me, let me, thanks for reminding me of that. So yes, look, you need to take it with a grain of salt. So in a couple of ways, right? People present themselves as being experts when they're not necessarily. And they present themselves as knowing things that they don't or can't necessarily know. Uh, but having said that, um, yes, you do need to pay attention and you do need to find good sources of information and elevate yourself uh, going forward. Now, let me give a couple of examples of what I mean about, about people pretending they know more than they do. So when people start up and stand up and start looking at graphs on the TV, so you're watching the, the nightly news or you're watching a, a, a website or a podcast or something and somebody comes up and they're looking at a graph and they can explain what's happened. You know, the price of gold went up and, and here's why. Well, you can always explain graphs. You can always explain history. Everyone can look backwards into the past and impose an explanation on what happened. I'd be impressed if they could look forward. If instead of saying what happened to the gold price yesterday, tell me what's going to happen to the gold price tomorrow. And then let's come back tomorrow and see if you were right or not. Now, they never do that because what that's going to reveal is that they're just making it up. That they're just, anyone can look backwards into time and, and pretend that they can explain what happened. Give that illusion of expertise. And anyone can say, okay, Sam or Kate, Oil price is going up, BHP is going down, the Aussie dollar is going up, inflation's going this way, um, et cetera. They can make those strong statements, but we never come back to check whether they were right or not. So look, you, should, you need to have a healthy level of skepticism 
about the level of expertise that people project to you through the screen. They always, you know, in finance, there's more pretending in finance than there is in almost anything else in the world. People are pretending that they're experts. And usually because they're trying to sell you something. I know that's not, that, that's not what's going on here, but usually it's because they're trying to sell you something. But they project a level of expertise they don't have. And if you're skeptical about that, that's a healthy, uh, it's good to have a healthy level of skepticism. But having said that, it is important to elevate your knowledge as time goes on. And so, you know, the kind of things that you're engaged in, Kate, are very helpful for that. People need to, to find good sources of information and elevate their understanding um, as time goes on. And as investors, what are some key economic terms or concepts we should be aware of? So when we do see that coming on TV or we, we see some mention in articles, um, we go, oh, I know what that is, or I, I can kind of understand what they're saying here. Yeah. So... So that's a good question. Now, it depends. You know I'm going to say it depends. People always say that. But it does depend upon, upon where you are in your investment journey. So, you know, if you were my age, it'd be, um, what should I do about my super? I know that's an important question at your age as well, but it's more important at my age. So, you know, I'm going to be retired in X year's time. Have I saved enough money? I need to really pay attention to super and get it right. Maybe I own a home and I've paid that off. How can I use the money that I've got stored in my, in my home to pay for my retirement uh, and for that kind of thing? Now, if, if, if it's people who are your age, then it's going to be more about saving for, uh, for a home or, to, to, for the, or saving to travel overseas, for instance, um, et cetera. So it's going to be a different set of criteria. But so I do think, so let's, let's take that. Let's take your example rather than my example. So I think some things to really pay attention to are interest rates and, and also uh, interest rates, mortgages in general, uh, inflation, and the things that are going to, to really affect the, the, the goals that you're trying to achieve. here. You know, you're saving to buy a house or an apartment. You're saving to go and live overseas. You're, you're, you have some short-term, medium-term, long-term financial goals. And, it's in, and, and in filtering out all of that information that's coming to you, focus on the things that are important for those goals. And if you're, if you're saving to, to buy a house, for instance, to buy an apartment or buy a house, then focus on those things. Focus on interest rates, fixed rates, floating rates, uh, how inflation is affecting that, how much money you can borrow uh, to invest, um, et cetera. So filter out the stuff that's important for the short-term and medium-term goals uh, that you've got. Absolutely. And if we take your example of saving up for our first home, which I know many of our listeners are trying to do, um, one of the key terms that comes up again and again, and we see on the advertising from the bank is what the interest rate is. Are, we, are you able to unpack that term a little bit more and what we need to know about interest rates and how they impact our lives? Sure. So, so, so first of all, let's just start, Kate, with two types of interest rates. So floating or variable interest rates. Usually we call them variable interest rates, but sometimes floating. So interest rates that go up and down versus interest rates that are fixed. And you can get a mortgage of either kind. You can get a mortgage where the interest that you pay is fixed for three years or five years, but it's more common, about 75% of mortgages in Australia are, are, are variable, floating interest rate. And so let, let's just take an example. Let's say that, that you want to get a, a mortgage for $500,000. So you, you saved $100,000. You're going to borrow $500,000. That would mean that you would have a loan to valuation ratio, which was 500 over 600. Of the $600,000 apartment that you're going to buy, the, the bank's bringing 500K. You're bringing 100K. The loan, the 500 to the valuation, the 600 is the 500 over 600, which is about 85%. And that's pretty high, but that's sort of what you got to do to get into the property market is, is to, to, yep. to borrow a lot of money. So let's say that we had a 500K uh, loan, then you've got to pay interest on that. And let's imagine that the interest rate, your interest rate at the moment is, uh, let's say that it's 2.4%. So you go and see a mortgage broker, maybe you go to the bank, but the most important thing is to go and see a mortgage broker. So your mortgage broker 
can put you in touch with all the banks. Whereas if you go and see a particular bank, if you just go to National Australia Bank, I don't mean to pick on that, they're a fine bank, but, but if you just go and see one bank, in a way you're just telling the bank that you're not really going to search. You sort of, you, you've got a, I don't need a very low interest rate sign on the top of your head if you just go to the bank branch. Whereas if you go to the mortgage broker, and especially if you let the mortgage broker know that, you, that you're talking to another mortgage broker, and then you're going to have, I need the lowest interest rate possible sign on your head. And the mortgage broker is going to try as possible, hard as possible to get your low interest rate. So let's say that you've got a $500,000 um, $500, mortgage. It's 2.4%. How much is that? 1% of 500000 is 5,000, 2.4 times 5,000 is $12,000 a year. So you'd have to pay $12,000 of interest per year on that mortgage. And then you'd have to pay the principal as well. If it was a principal and interest loan, which is what it's gonna be, it's not gonna be an interest only mortgage, interest only loan. That's what you would want if you're an investor, investing in a property rather than buying one to live in. So it's going to be principal and interest. You're going to be paying the $12,000 interest and you're going to be paying back the $500,000. That's the principal part. That'll be, uh, that'll be on top of it. But if it's a variable rate, I know this is a long answer, so I'll shut up in a moment. But if it's a variable rate mortgage, which is most likely it's going to be, could be fixed rate for three years. But if it's variable rate, then if the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia, let's come back to them in just a moment. If they put interest rates up, then your 2.4% will go up. And if they put interest rates up, because the RBA charges, sets the interest rate here, and then the banks add a margin on top of it of about 2.4%. And we live in extraordinary times, Kate, as you know, and interest rates are approximately zero from the RBA at the moment. And the banks always put about 2.4% on top of that to make their profits. So you got 2.4%. But if the RBA increased it, it's actually at 0.1%. So that's pretty close to zero. If they increased it to 1.1%, the banks would, would, would add that on. And we go from 2.4 plus 1.1 to, to, let's say, 3.5. And then we would go from you paying $12,000 interest to paying $17,500 interest. It, it would drift up. And, and in the last few years, those interest rates have been drifting down. But if the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia, increases interest rates, then, that, then they'll drift up. Sorry to mm. be so And as interest, oh, no worries, no worries. And as interest rates go up, that makes it potentially more difficult for people to pay that interest on their, their mortgage each year. Is that correct? That is, that is correct. Um, and look, the, it's, it's not all bad. So the reason that interest, that, that the RBA would put interest rates up is, is if they're worried about inflation. So we've had low levels of inflation uh, through time where, where inflation means the general price of things. You let's, let's call it consumer price inflation, CPI, consumer price inflation. The Australian Bureau of Statistics, let's not bring in too many different players, but the Australian Bureau of Statistics <laughs> looks at, just to tell you what inflation is and what CPI is, they look at a basket, a typical basket that a typical household buys. They look at 125 things, everything from movie tickets to cars to, to rents on houses to health insurance to computers, et cetera, uh, to, to food and education and, and travel and, and everything. They look at 125 things. And then they look at that basket of things that, that a typical household buys, how much that goes up year by year. And if across the whole basket, those things, because some will go down and some will go up, you know, maybe petrol goes up and computers go down um, or vice versa. But across that whole basket, if their prices go up by 2%, then that's what we mean by consumer price inflation. Uh, and, and that gets released every quarter, every three months uh, in Australia, the CPI figure, and it has a big effect. Now, the, the, the Reserve Bank of Australia, and the way you should think about the Reserve Bank is it's the bank's bank. Just like you have a bank, you know, like, like A and Z, or maybe you have a credit union, um, or maybe you, maybe you have a building society, but just like you have a, a bank, then the banks have a bank. And their bank is called the Reserve Bank of Australia. Um, and just as what you want from your bank 
is to be able to access money when you want it and to make payments. That's what they want from their bank, to, to access money, to, to you know, get folding money when they want it. When, when, you, when you want some folding money for the weekend, then you go to the ATM. Um, I know you don't use cash anymore, but when people want cash, and I don't either, right? But people do go to ATM and get cash out. There's a lot of cash in circulation. When you want cash, you go to the ATM. When, when Westpac wants cash, they send an armored car around to the RBA. And when you, 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 know, you want 800 bucks for the weekend, they want 40 million stacked in the back of the, RBA, back of the armored car. So you know, the RBA is the bank's bank, but the, the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia, is charged by the federal government with controlling inflation, not letting inflation get too high or get too low. And too low has been the concern over the last 10 years, but too high is the concern now. You know, in COVID-19, a lot of money got pumped into, into the economy, JobKeeper and JobSeeker and, and all the kinds of incentives for companies, a lot of government spending and a lot of creation of new money in a thing called quantitative easing. Let's talk about that another time. But all of that stimulus has really sped up the economy. There's a lot of demand and it's pushing prices up. And the RBA is worried about it. And, and the, the tool that they have to slow the economy down and to, to stop prices rising too quickly is to put interest rates up. And if they do that, variable mortgage rates will go up. Remember that the banks add about 2.4% on top of the interest rate that the RBA sets. Now, you know how I said, I know my answers are very long-winded, so but I'll be brief with this, but you know how I said that the RBA is worried about inflation, prices going up. Well, it has been very worried about deflation, prices starting to go down or inflation getting very low. And that's why it cut interest rates all the way down to zero in COVID-19. We really do live in extraordinary times. And then you got the 2.4% the on top of that. And that's why mortgages are at about 2.4%. But now inflation is coming back. And what we're looking at is the RBA increasing interest rates to control inflation and that pushing interest rates up and then it'll, it'll push up the, the interest people have to pay on their mortgages. Mm. And if inflation does go up, what apart from the having to pay higher interest rates on mortgages, what are the other impacts to consumers that maybe we should be aware of? Well, you know, for investors, it's, it's so that the downside, if you buy a house is, um, uh, if you, if you buy a, an apartment or a house, the downside is that if you've got a floating rate mortgage, now remember you can fix your interest rate um, and talk to your mortgage broker about that. Do I want a fixed rate or do I want a floating rate? And, and go to some different places. A good place to, to go to look at interest rates is rate city, rate city without any spaces, .com .au. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention that on your on your podcast yeah. they got nothing yeah, to do no, with me, except... i think we've mentioned that before yeah, yeah okay <laughs> good so the um and they got nothing to do with me doesn't help me to to recommend them they just have a good calculator they just it's just a good way to find the lowest cost uh the lowest interest rate mortgages and you want to go there before you go to the mortgage broker you want to do your homework before you speak to someone who can actually get you a mortgage uh, and, and the reason for that is your interests and the mortgage broker's interests are not perfectly aligned. You want the lowest interest rate. What they want is to get the transaction done quickly. You know, on your $500,000 mortgage, they'll get paid $3,000 by the bank. And then they'll get $1,000 per year, 2.2% as a trailing fee. So they'll get $3,000 for getting all the paperwork done and the whole thing underway with the bank. And then they'll get $1,000 a year every year that the mortgage exists. So the mortgage broker just wants to get the job done. And what you want is the lowest interest rate. And it might be that if the interest rate's a little bit higher, it'll be a bank that's easier for the mortgage broker to deal with, less paperwork for the mortgage broker, and happens faster. So there's less chance for the whole thing to fall over before they get their $3,000 and $1,000 a year. So you go to the mortgage broker and you just want the lowest interest rate. They want the most convenience. So you've got to do your homework before you go. Get the lowest interest rate in your mind. Go to the mortgage broker and say, I I'm looking at ratecity.com. I can see this interest rate. You know, it's a and, and really low interest rates are around 2%. I said 2.4%, but that was typical. 
So the lowest one's around 2%. I can see a, a, an interest rate that's 2.05%. Let's talk about that uh, when, you, when you go, to, the, when you go to, to speak to your mortgage broker. So look, inflation's not all bad because when you buy the apartment, inflation will push the price of the apartment up and, and it'll push your, your salary up as well. So, so yes, the, you know, the problem with interest rates is, is the bad comes immediately. So the RBA puts your interest rate up, it puts the interest rates up by 1% and it's a, a $500,000 mortgage. So you go from paying $12,000 per year to $17,000 per year the extra 5,000, the 1% of the RBA trying to, control, con trying to control inflation. And so the problem for you, increased interest payments, comes all in one go. Bang, you go from paying 12,000 to paying 17,000 uh, in, in one go, 17,500 from our example before, in, in one go. But then the benefits come slowly. And in the end, the benefits equal the problem or, or might even exceed it. And the benefits are that your salary will go up. With inflation. We'll have a, some kind of wage negotiation. There'll be tension for your employer to pay you more, otherwise you'll go to, to a better job. Um, and then the value of your, of your apartment will go up with inflation. Um, so it won't be all bad. And, and in the end, it might be the, the good might outweigh the bad. The problem is the bad's very front loaded. Um, and and so, so you need to, to bear that in mind. And you need to think forward a little bit. If interest rates went up, 2%, am I going to be able to handle that? Am I going to have enough cash flow to make sure that I, that I can pay, uh, make my payments or, or am I overextending myself? So look, your question and your observation throughout this, Kate, is that there's a set of things that you need to, to concentrate on and interest rates are one of them. And, and so when people say the RBA interest rates, you know, when you hear on the radio um, that you are, when you hear on Triple J, for instance, um, the, um, sometimes I say two triple J to show you what an old guy I am, because when I was your age, that's what they were called. They were Sydney radio station, believe it or not. But, uh, and sometimes I actually say that, and my, and my kids wonder, what, what is he talking about when he says two triple J? But anyway, here on, on, you hear on triple J that, uh, that interest rates have gone up. The RBA has increased interest rates from 0.1% to 1%. Now, that wouldn't happen. They would only increase it in quarter percent increments. You know, they might increase it from 0.1% to 0.35 to, to 0.6, et cetera, small increments. They meet on the first Tuesday of every month uh, and they make that decision. You know, here on Triple J, on the news that interest rates have gone up, they're talking about the RBA interest rate. They're not talking about the 2.4 or 2.5% the banks add on top of that. And so you want to pay attention to that and, and think about whether interest rates are going up and, and find some reliable sources of information like yourself um, about what's happening to interest rates and think forward a little bit. You know, do I want to fix my interest rate? Is that going to work for me? Should I talk to my broker about that? Um, so stay on top of what those things mean. Listen to good sources of information and just sort of think through what your own situation is and what your short-term and medium-term medium -term goals are. But, you know, your, your exact question um, was, your direct question, Kate, was, you know, is, is inflation always going to be bad? And what kind of other things is it going to affect? Um, well, it's not always going to be bad. You know, it's just that it's very front loaded when it comes to mortgages. Yeah, I, I feel like the media sort of attaches inflation to very negative words and negative imagery. So when I, when I think of that word, that sort of conjures up. But I, I guess, as you've explained it, there is um, pros and cons to sort of inflation rising and lowering and just sort of thinking more broadly about how that impacts us as consumers and investors is really interesting to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not all bad. I mean, that sort of harks back to bad experiences that people have had in the past. You know, in all of culture, there is, you know, not just in, in economics, but in, but in all of culture and all of, and culture is really the conversation that society is having with itself all the time. You know, in all of culture, the past is always with us. And, and people have the memory of what happened in the 1970s. Where we had very high unemployment, low growth, very high inflation. And so, you know, there's a real um, negative sentiment uh, associated with, with inflation. Um, but actually, some, some inflation, not, not too, what, what the Reserve Bank wants is inflation between 2 and 3% per year. 
But even if inflation went to four or five percent for a while, that wouldn't be, you know, that wouldn't be such a bad thing. That could that could help uh, in many ways. Absolutely. And one of the last terms I wanted to unpack a bit more is the idea of supply and demand as we hear about it a lot. And even just thinking um, examples at the moment, like there's a lack of workers in the hospitality industry and all the cafes are having to pay higher wages. I think I saw an article of like the hundred dollar dishwasher um, getting paid that much money to just wash dishes per hour, just because there's such a shortage. Are you able to talk a little bit more about supply and demand and how that yeah. affects asset prices? Right. So, so, so let's start with the dishwasher and then, and then we'll go to asset prices uh, in just a second. Um, so, so the supply of dishwashers, I mean, these are people we're talking about. So the supply yeah. of people who, who wash, wash, I'll just make sure I don't <laughs> say something stupid. But yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the supply of, of people who wash dishes or the number of people who wash dishes is, is much reduced for the, for the catering sector um, because we don't have a lot of foreign students and, and we don't have a lot of backpackers. I mean, there's a huge number of backpackers come to Australia, as you know, and a lot of them work in hospitality. A lot of them work in, in, in agribusiness and picking fruit and the like, and then they sort of move backwards and forwards and then, and then they either stay, that's a, I personally think is a good thing, or they, or they go home, um, et cetera. But that supply of people to do that is dried up. So now you've got the same amount of demand or you've got returning demand. You know, in the lockdowns, uh, people can't go to cafes, uh, can't go to, to pubs, can't go to restaurants. So hospitality is very constrained. And, and, and you've got a big supply of labour. No, so you, you don't have all of those backpackers and foreign students, but you do have ordinary Australians and you don't have much demand for that labour. So you've got a big excess supply to demand in the market, and the government has to step in. That's why we have to have JobKeeper yeah, and, and JobSeeker, but especially JobKeeper at that point in the COVID-19 crisis is because a lot of people who were previously working in hospitality, there's no demand for that. All the restaurants are shut, but you know everyone's got to live and we, got to, we all got to carry on with dignity. So the government has to step in with, with, with JobKeeper there. But now we're in a situation where where the, where the demand's gone way up. Everyone's going back to pubs and, 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 and to clubs and restaurants and the like, and demand's gone way up. And now we've got excess demand. And now the supply can increase if people stop doing what they're doing, you know, driving, driving Ubers or, or, um, or, or whatever it is, you know, working as, as in, in realty or, or something else, if they, if they shift to the hospitality sector. So if there's excess demand for restaurant meals and not enough people to wait the tables and to clean the dishes, then if the wages in that sector go up, if the price that is paid to people, wages are just prices after all, the price of labour, if those prices go up, it'll draw in those people from other sectors. So if wages in hospitality go up and wages elsewhere in relative terms uh, don't go up, um, then people will be drawn in. And you can see that, that it's the prices themselves that is getting supply and demand together. This is how it works in a free economy. That's why you know, we started off this conversation, Kate, with, with you uh, asking me and making observations that some economies are sort of centrally planned, where some bureaucrat is telling everyone what to do, and others are free market economies, where people decide for themselves. But what's the coordinating mechanism? What makes those people think, you know what, I'm going to stop being a, 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 a Diddy driver and I'm going to go and work in, in that restaurant? Well, it's wages. You know, they're making their own choice. But the, but the higher wage is the thing that's coordinating all those choices uh, uh, within the economy. So it, it's prices that coordinate all those choices. People look at prices and then make decisions. You know, how much can I earn? How much is it going to cost me? You know, I'm thinking of flying from, from Perth to Melbourne. Um, should I fly on Virgin or should I fly on, on, on Qantas? Well, maybe I should go to the Gold Coast instead. So though, and, and in making those choices, I'm looking at prices, aren't I? And everyone's looking at the same prices and making their own choices. So it's the prices that are coordinating all those individual choices and setting supply and demand equal. Uh, um, to each other. Is the it's goal a big, you... it's a big topic. 
it's hard to explain just by waving your yeah. hand. <laughs> is the goal usually for supply to meet demand or is that an impossible target? Well, unless there's something preventing it from happening, um, you know, it, it's like water. It'll just flow to the same level. Unless something is, unless there's some sort of uh, impediment in the market that is stopping supply and demand from coming together, then that will happen automatically. Now, there's, there's lots of things that can go wrong in markets. Um, and so sometimes the government has to intervene in the market. So like minimum wages, for instance. So when the demand for, for, um, uh, for people to wash dishes and to wait tables, when that demand goes away down in the COVID-19 crisis, it doesn't mean that, that restaurateurs can charge whatever they want. You know, you can't, you can't, so pay whatever they want. You can't pay people less than the minimum wage. So there's, and, and that's the government intervening in the labour market just to establish a level of fairness and to prevent, and, to, and just to make sure that there's a balance in, in power here between employees and employers. And so it doesn't just reach its own equilibrium, its own sort of balance between supply and demand. The government intervenes. And then, and then you end up with supply being a lot more than demand because wages can't fall. And then the government comes in with, comes in, comes in with JobKeeper. But unless there's something, unless there's some uh, impediment or some government intervention, Supply and demand will just come together automatically. You know, the, when there's a lot of supply for people to wash, a lot of demand for people to wash dishes, wages will come, go up and people will move from other sectors into hospitality. And then the supply of hospitality will go up. You know, the prices themselves will bring supply and demand back into, back into equilibrium. And, and you were asking earlier, Kate, does that happen in investing? Absolutely, it happens in investing. You know, when we were talking about our, when we were talking about our, um, uh, our mortgage example earlier, and we were saying that the interest rate is the, is the, the, the RBA's part. At the moment, that's close to zero, but, but it, we're expecting it to go up at some stage, probably not next year, maybe the year after. Um, the, the, um, there's the RBA's component, but then there's the bank's components, the 240 basis points. Uh, if I use that expression. So 2.4% is the same as 240 basis points, but that's a very common expression in mortgage, uh, in talking about mortgages. But that 2.4%, that itself is supply and demand. You know, there's a lot of demand for mortgages across all the people who want to refinance their existing mortgage or to get a new mortgage to buy something. And then there's a lot of supply of mortgages, the money that banks have available to lend out to people. And those two things, the demand for mortgages, all of those millions of mortgages out there, and the supply of money to, to be the mortgages from banks, those two things have to come together at the interest rate. You know, the interest rate is just a price. And if there's more demand for mortgages than there is su supply, then that 2.4% will go up. Not the RBA's part, the RBA sets that. Hmm. But the bank part, that bank margin will will. will if there's more demand than there is supply, that'll go up. If there's more supply from banks and more competition between the banks, that'll go down. Now, before COVID-19, that was about 2.6%, that part. You know, mm. it's pretty stable, but sometimes it's more and sometimes it's less. Uh, but that is supply and demand in the market. Uh, and, and we see that. So it's not just in hospitality, you know, in goods and services. It's, it's, it's in investments as well, all types of investments. Yeah, and I think that's really good to just start observing the world around you a little bit more and looking at what the banks are doing just to sort of start to get an idea of these concepts and how it all interacts. And those, as you've mentioned, those individual decisions uh, lead into the prices. And there are so many more things I'd love to ask you, but I don't want to overwhelm anyone in today's episode. So Sam, thank you so much for coming on today. And if you want to, um, if anyone wants to get in touch with you or check out some of your amazing courses, uh, are you able to just tell us a little bit more about them? Well, so I, so I, so I have a YouTube channel, um, which is Windlestone. So if you just, if you, if you uh, Google Dr. Sam Wiley, S-A-M, and Wiley is W-Y-L-I-E, Whiskey, Yankee, Lima, Indigo, Echo, um, if that makes it easier. <laughs> so if you just Google Dr. Sam Wiley, then you'll come to, to my YouTube channel. And you'll see that also that, that I teach courses for private investors uh, through our company, which is called um, which is called Windlestone Education. 
Yeah, I attended one of your webinars a few months ago and found it really beneficial. It was a really a deep dive into inflation and how that impacts uh, investors. So uh, I definitely recommend checking Sam's channel out and I'll make sure I include it in the show notes so you can easily access it as well. Brilliant. Thanks for inviting me, Kate. Really enjoyed Thank you it. so much, Sam. And uh, I'll definitely have to get you back for a part two. I'd love that.